Hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite show about cognition, creativity, and this week, lateral thinking of withered technology. That is a mouthful. What are we talking about? <laughs> it is. It is. And we'll get to where that comes from. It's a it's a crazy uh, it's a crazy phrase from the the history of Nintendo. OK, uh, but before we get into the history of Nintendo, like I was thinking about this the other day, you and I are basically and I mean, so many like true purists are going to get down on me for this. You and I kind of, in my perspective, are are the history of video games. Like consoles came out when we were very, very young. Uh, yeah. No, just to orient the audience here. I was born in 1980. I was born in 82. And I understand that the Atari came out in like 78. But like yeah, there were definitely we, there were video games before us. But but we had one. We, we saw the rise and change of video games. I remember the old uh, we had an old Atari that had to like you had to hang things on the TV. And we had. So, I mean, in my life, we went from on all console history, handheld history, VR, uh all of the kind of modern things that's our that's our cognition that's our our memory the first video game i have a strong memory of uh was a chuck e cheese and it was made okay. it was made it was a arcade game but made for like toddlers because i was like five years old and i could stand at it you know it was like okay. it wasn't like you need to be on a stool like the whole thing probably was a four foot tall sure um console and uh it was a uh, it was a noah's ark game and i remember interesting Thinking back, I bet it had a screen turn sideways because it was a vertical. You would play vertically. You were Noah at the bottom of the screen uh -huh. and the, the arc was at the top and you would walk down. So it wasn't a side scroller. It was an up or down. You're looking kind of down almost like God mode. You know? And you walked down and you would walk down. Interesting. And you had to go get to an animal. And then once you touched it, it would follow you back to the arc. Um, and the water was at this virtual screen. So why would they do that? The That's water was at the bottom. The water's rising. It kept rising. So you had to go to the bottom first. If you started at the top, you'd lose animals. <laughs> so you had to go to the bottom, get the animal, come Was back. there jumping or were you? No, it was just walking. And there were like bushes and rocks as obstacles. Okay. Um, you know, it was very, you remember, you know, Oregon Trail hunting mode. It yes. was along those okay. lines. It okay. was, that was the same kind of like it was like a three quarter view, sort of like you okay. weren't dead over and you weren't side. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I remember playing that. Uh, and, and then also they had Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. But the, that little Noah's Ark game is the first video game I remember before we even owned a computer in our house. No, I mean, so I uh, we had a we had the we had an old Atari that I don't remember. We had like five or six games, but truly the only one I remember is Pitfall, <laughs> yeah. which uh, if, if, you, if you're unfamiliar and you're not old, uh, Pitfall, it was a side scroller where very 16 bit blocky or 8 bit. I don't even remember the just <laughs> probably eight. Yeah, <laughs> blocky, awful. And you'd run and you'd like jump over pits and not try to fall in them. It was a very literal game. Was it a uh, running game? Did, like, did you control the motion or was he always running? Uh, you controlled. That's all you controlled is. So it was a joystick game and a single button. So you could go forward, backward or hit a button to jump. And so you'd run and there'd be like uh, pools of water with crocodiles. And then you'd have to jump. And there was these swinging vines and you'd have to time it just right to grab and, and swing. And that's all it was. It was jumping over pits and, and swinging on vines. That was the entirety yeah. of the game. So I recall, yeah, eventually we both got PCs in our house. Sure. G Gateway 2000 machines. If sure. Anybody... Well, no, my first was an IBM 486. Oh, really? Before that? Yes. No, I, I, my first, we always had a computer. I mean, I was born in 82. I think my parents bought it in like 83, 84. We had the, uh, the, the, the IBM 486 and we had, uh, the Sierra games were very big. We played King's Quest, Space Quest, Police Quest, all back in the original where they were type in. Like you had yeah, to, they right, were like right. one step beyond Zorg. Like you had to type in like, you know, handcuff in the back. Like you had to, you know, yep. open. I do not know that command. And so, you know, I play RPGs, tabletop RPGs now, but like from the, from my background, like it's not that different. You're like going there and you have to give it commands in the DM, which was virtual. It was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, there like, were, um, I remember the games I remember most came much later, which were the LucasArts games where it was like pick up magazine, give to doorman. Right. Uh, but even that was click and point. But before that, right. you had to literally guess right. what you could do. So like after King's Quest and Police Quest and Space Quest uh, and uh, came Quest for Glory, which was in the same vein, but it was much, much higher resolution. And yes, it was a uh, it was point and click and you could choose like speak or pick up or fight or attack. So it's still the same things, but now there was a, a set number of things you could do, like observe and look. And, and then there was also a Robin Hood on, in the same vein. 
I still really preferred the having to figure out like what to say. And, and it was it even remember, though there was still a set number of things, it felt like it was a bigger world to me. Do you remember before AOL America Online, there was Prodigy? I do. Yeah, and my neighbor had Prodigy. That was the first time I'd ever been on the Internet. Yeah, we, we had Prodigy and Prodigy was like AOL where, yeah, there was the Internet, but mostly you were supposed to use their right. services and they had a, um, a maze game that was kind of like that you would navigate a maze and then you'd come to like clearings in the woods and it was the same kind of thing you had to decide what to do with the right. items no and i mean i i understand that as the technology got better it was actually progress but i remember as of going to the point and click games it felt it felt less it felt like i couldn't just say what i wanted even though the computer was running off a very finite number of things it felt like a, a limitation but yeah the graphics got better so so then yeah there was there was all the consoles started showing up in people's houses there right. I, I never had an original nintendo but i did a lot of my friends did played that um friends got sega genesis right uh we had a game boy which right. was awesome right I loved the game boy yep. but uh eventually I really wanted a Super Nintendo when it came out, sure. and it was a lot of money back right. then. And uh, I ended up not only saving money, but um, selling the Game Boy and all the Game Boy games. I sold all of it to get a Super Nintendo, nice, <laughs> and uh, made made that work. And at that point, that probably was the most advanced computer in our household, because <laughs> so we had a, an aging, you know, gateway computer at that point, and the Super Nintendo, which was just like the most amazing thing in the world then. No, I mean, and we like. Uh, so yeah, we got a Gateway 2000 computer the same time we got AOL, uh, so like 1994, 93. Yeah. Um, and then in 96, I started getting into online gaming. I was very, very, very early in online gaming. Uh, so I, I was playing Quake, and I, I joined yes. a Quake clan. <laughs> and and so, I mean, we had our 14.4 and our 28.8 and our 15. Like, when I finally got a 28.8 modem, I started doing like online, uh, playing with my friends after school and, and joining and playing online Quake and, and dealing with you know, I'm on IRC and getting into flame wars with like other Quake clans, which now I look back and like, <laughs> who uh, were those guys? Yeah, like, you know, other 12 year olds, <laughs> like, like we're all so big and mature, but like we're on AOL and IRC, like flame warring each other ba because of, of Quake. But yeah, the early, early internet gaming. But it's, it's crazy when you start thinking about like, that really was the beginning of internet. Now you can't sit down at a console, a, a play, a, a, a PlayStation, and play Call of Duty without the headset and talking to other people. And you're like, yeah, online gaming is almost, almost all gaming now. Like most games have some form of online component, but yeah, or online mode. Like very few games, all the ones I like, but very few games are, are 100 percent self-contained. They at least have even Hitman, my favorite game of all time. You can play online. I don't, but you you could right. play online. But that wasn't a thing. That wasn't it, it that, before nineteen ninety five. That wasn't a a thing. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy just to see what has happened, you know. And then same thing, you know. We went from Nintendo, which we did have, and we big Final Fantasy players at my house, and then the Super Nintendo, and then the Nintendo sixty four, which was mine. It's the only console that was mine and not my brother's. Yeah, I missed Nintendo sixty four. Was exactly when I went to college and. Uh, it was our fr it was my freshman year. It was your sophomore year. Okay, so I, it was it overlapped high school a little bit. Yeah. yeah. By by the time I was like, oh, I wonder what this deal is with Nintendo sixty four. I was I was busy and I, I kind of yeah, missed nineteen ninety six. I missed my like freshman five year. years of video games because yeah. I I didn't get one until I was walking past a GameStop and it was like sixty nine dollars comes with three free games because it was like <laughs> like old. Yeah. Uh, and I bought it and had the purple translucent controller. Nice. And you know I had Donkey Kong and 007, which was the only good game for Nintendo 64. Yeah, I definitely played those, but just never owned them. Um, but it's it's this crazy, uh, you know, video games. Really, if you look at modern adults, which is to say, us. Yeah. And you compare it to the generation just before us. You know, the the gen, uh, the true Gen X is. We're right on the edge of of what would be called millennials. We're the, I, the sandwich. <laughs> we're the sandwich uh, generation. But if you look at like my brother Brett, who's ten years older than me, and he's an entrepreneur and an awesome guy. He's played video games. I mean, he, he's absolutely he's played World of Warcraft and stuff like that. But he wasn't defined by video games because at 18 years old, when I was eight, we still had a basic Nintendo like video games were an ad advent of his adulthood, whereas video games shaped our generation in so many very real ways, like yeah. Oregon Trail, you mentioned, they they made us play that at school. Yeah, no, I remember my first experience with computers was elementary school. They had a computer lab for the first time ever, sure. and we were second graders probably i didn't have a computer at home yet right and the the very first thing they taught us actually was 
essentially programming because there wasn't a lot else you could do with computers. We, did you ever, ever have the the turtle uh, programming game? Oh, yeah. You, and you would, had to like give it like it you turn left commands. and you give it like, commands. Yeah. Like one F meant one pixel forward F. And so you wanted to make a square. You would do like 10 F uh, turn, like turn right. Yep. 10 forward, turn right, 10 forward. And you could make shapes by. Yeah, I do. Uh, I remember that. making that turtle walk around the screen. That was, that was late. That was fifth or sixth grade for me. Yeah, that well, that existed earlier because I, I had that yeah. in like 1985 that they, they had. Oh, wow. They, they went through. Um, different versions of it. I remember the very first one we had, the turtle was like four pixels. Oh, gotcha. And then I remember later there was one where it was like 64 uh, pixels. Mine was like 64 pixels. Yeah, it actually they, looked like a turtle. They upgraded the turtle. No, when I did it, it was four, no, five boxes. One box was the body. Four pixels was the body. And then a pixel for each foot and a pixel that, for the head. That makes sense. <laughs> that was the first no, version. And, I mean, and if you think about it, like, think it's fun. My, my kids are obsessed with Minecraft right now. So we play Minecraft as yeah. a family each day. And it's, it's really fun to look at Minecraft and look at how bad the graphics are. But like, Minecraft graphics are actually truly incredible the more you play it, with them. It, it looks like old fashioned video games, it, but then it's like, well, you fly through 3D space and, you know, yeah, go into like, a cave and the, the most, lighting changes. It's so anachronistic. Yeah, because it's like it's like, man, it looks all blocky, but it's three dimensional. And that wasn't a thing until Nintendo 64. And then like it, it's yeah, it's it's amazing. The history of video games and how it is truly, you know, we have Twitch now, which is the future of sports and people mock that. But it, really is it's the e-gaming is is a very real thing now yeah. and and it's the future of business like i had we uh, i'm not trying to go businessy on this but i had a client they didn't end up signing with us but called us called me a few months ago and they were in a uh they were a sports agency that wanted me to help them elevate their position in e-gaming because I was going to PAX East and going to all these gaming conventions. And they're like, hey, we're a sports agency and we do like accounting and financial planning for athletes. We want you to help us do financial planning for e-sports athletes. It's all the same stuff. It's all the and they're like, but we don't have an in there. We're seen as like these old guys. We want you to help us be the the Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire. Uh, <laughs> that's an old reference. Wow. It's, um, but it's so crazy what video games when I was a kid, video games weren't a thing. I mean, they were, but it was a joystick and they were yeah, it was pixels a, it was a toy on the television on that a big it. CRT and adults mocked it. And now it's a multi billion dollar multiple industry. So it's not an industry. There's esports, there's gaming, there's conventions, there's there's multiple industries that pin themselves around gaming. That is true. We are going to take a quick break. I want to. Uh pivot these video game conversations into uh, another subject here so mm -hmm. we will be right back hey Jeff and I wanted to take a minute just here at the top of the show to say thank you for joining us on our new podcast and YouTube show, Release the Creative. Whether you're new to our brand of crazy or you followed us over from one of our other social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, we'd like to thank you for joining us here. Please take this moment to hit the subscribe and the like button and also that funny little notification button so that you can be uh, notified of all our new episodes. We're really trying to get this new show up on the road. Thank you so much for watching. All right, so we are back from our break, and we are talking video games today. Yes. Uh, primarily and specifically the rise of uh, not just video games themselves, but the hardware, how it invaded our homes. Right. I mean, and if you think about it, like, it's one of those things that technology allows for new games, and then new games push technology, and then technology pushes new games, and then new games give... It's, it's this kind of vicious circle. People invent a new thing to make something new possible, and then because that new thing is possible, they invent more games, which needs new things, which needs... It, it's it's a vicious circle right, of, so of technological creep. <coughs> what exactly... T put that to me in terms of uh, book learning. What, what do we call this <laughs> so, phenomenon? Um, so... Uh, lots of different things. But first off, I like that you said book learning. This is not a plug. Uh, this is not a paid endorsement unless someone would like me to pay me to say it. Read <laughs> the book uh, History of Video Games and 64 Objects. It is actually just so freaking fascinating. It honestly starts off with like uh, bowling, which is, if you mm -hmm. think about it, sort of considered a video, bowling and pinball and goes and pachinko machines yeah. and goes all the way up through like the modern console and VR. And it's called The History of Video Games and 64 Objects. It is not written by a person. It was written by a society uh, and a museum. And it was all just kind of col collaboration, collaboration okay. and and uh, um, 
curated it was a curation okay. and they decided project. right it was a, oh so 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 good um but uh today's episode is called lateral thinking of withered technology which is one of my absolute when i heard about this it it spoke to my soul um gunpei yokoi and let me just say right now if i'm saying his name wrong i am so so sorry <laughs> i have never taken a japanese class and i don't speak I, I, I might be a bad romanization anyway but gunpei yokoi he was one of the uh he started off as a an engineer, a a line mechanic fixing playing card machines at the small family owned company Nintendo. Okay. Uh, right what, at what era are we talking about here? Uh, eighteen. <laughs> sorry, nineteen sixty. The sixties. Okay. Nineteen sixties. Um, he it was a it was a playing card company. The Nintendo was from the eighteen hundreds, and yeah, they, they'd been around for a while. They'd been around. They were totally family owned, and he got a job. Uh, he has a he was an engineer. He got a job fixing machines. And I'm going to skip a huge amount of the story because I could talk about his life for hours. Uh, I have studied him deeply. Uh, but what I want to get to is that fast forward, he now became the head of their toy department because he invented their first toy. It was called the Ultra Hand. Look it up. It's super cool. Um, I mean, it's super simple, but it's super cool. Um, and it gets into the lateral thinking of wither technology a little bit. But what I really want to talk about is so video games were already a thing. We had we had a. Uh, um, Arcades, which we totally didn't talk about at all in the first yeah. segment, but which we could have. Uh, we ha there was arcades, video games, and pinball machines, and the concept of a video game already existed. Um, and so one day, he's on the train home, and he looks across the way, and and all these people are trying to. Uh, th there's video games, like I said, are being made, but there's these. They're arcades. They're standing machines. They weigh hundreds of pounds. Yeah. Which is why arcades are a thing, because. Nobody would own all of these. You could, you could maybe spend seven, eight hundred dollars on one, but you wouldn't. Anyway, so arcades were a thing, uh, and he's he's on the ride home, and he's trying to figure out what the next big thing of toys is going to be. What's the next thing he's going to be able to invent and create and sell? And he watches this man across the aisle. Uh, I have this wholesome in my head. I don't know if it happened, like I'm imagining, <laughs> but I've read the story by several accounts. And he's sitting and he's playing with a calculator. Now, this is the uh, the late seventies. Um, I think I have the deer somewhere, but he's he's playing with a calculator and he's just entertaining himself by by just punching in numbers. Calculators are not hard. They are remarkably simple pressure switches, very simple LCD, even solar panel. Like they are so cheap. They're something banks give away for free. Like they're yeah. just and he was looking at it and he's like, it doesn't cost anything to make. They're small. They're portable. They're circuit based. Why does it have to be numbers? And so the Game & Watch was born. And the Game & Watch is was the, the precursor to the Game Boy. And it was that canned spinach color screen, but that you could put in one painted backdrop, like one sketched backdrop, and you could do one game. And so you'd put in, you know, this is where Mario Brothers, not Super Mario Brothers, this is where Mario Brothers came from. The very first one, And yeah. Donkey Kong. And they had Blackjack, and they had all these, they had like hundreds of different games you could only play one, and it was basically a calculator. You could push a few different buttons, and it would move little calculator pieces around and interact. You could play kind of a tennis game. You could play a lot of different things. And it was all based on he want, And even uh, as people were trying to increase the, the technological capability, and, hey, we could do this, and we could do this, and we could do this, he kept on saying, like, no, let's, let's rein this in let's use yesterday's technology not tomorrow's and they're like but but if we have the coolest coolest new thing on the market people will spring to us and he said right but we don't know what that where that's going we don't know all of the problems with it if we use old stuff it's cheap if we use old stuff we know what it's capable of if we use old stuff we 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 can do really cool innovative stuff because it's a known quantity we just have to have lateral thinking of withered technology. So withered meaning established, old, not obsolete, but not obsolete, but still works. But uh, it's been around and it's been mm -hmm. tried and true and tested. This is kind of like uh, a lot of people do this now. They 
specifically try to play, especially if you're PC gaming, they'll buy older games because mm-hmm. it runs better on your hardware. They're a lot cheaper. You can get them in the bargain bin and right. you don't have to spend top dollar on something that's going to not run very well. Right. Uh, so that's a similar concept to what it's a similar do. concept. And this is an adjacent concept that I don't want to spend too much on. But like right now, you can go buy a looks like an old Super Nintendo or old Nintendo, but it's like three. It's right. a little big, the little square one. Yeah. And it has because of modern hardware and modern USB and stuff. It has like 3000 games on it Yeah, mm-hmm. because it can. And you just plug it in and now you can play for hours. And you're now you could argue that that's more retro and nostalgic, but it's still the same thing. It's let's use because we can we can have way more fun with older things. We can use, it takes up less space, it takes up less tech. We can do cool stuff with it. Um, There's hundreds of examples that I can play with this, but in the interest of time, and like I said, I really could do, I could talk for hours about this man. Um, But my favorite example of this is in an interview with him, he was talking about how he kept getting pushed by the owners of Nintendo and other engineers to push it, push it further. And he was like, look, the game comes first. You, Anyone who's heard me talk a lot, especially you, has heard me say I work for the show. Right. I got that from Gunpei Yokoi. Mm-hmm. He, he didn't say I work for the show. <laughs> he said the game comes first. Make the tech that plays the game. Don't build tech and then write the game because that's going to make bloated tech with unnecessary abilities that take more battery and more that you, that you don't need. And that's uh, Nintendo has taken that philosophy since then. The, right. The, the Wii was never super powered, but it had a new control system. Right. The Game Boy was not as advanced as the Game Gear, but was way more popular because it played the games better right. and, and lasted that, longer. That one's the one I want to specifically talk about. So he they were working on the Game Boy forever, but Sega was already on the scene and they were already it was already an arms race and they're making the Game Boy as the uh, the, the upgrade of the Game and Watch. And they finally announced it, and Gunpei is sitting in his office, and and one of his workers comes in and has a look, just this grim look on his face, and he said, Sega just announced they're doing a handheld like ours. And and Gunpei looked up and he goes like, will it, and full color was capable. That There was, there was a possibility for that, and he had been pressured by everyone to make it color, because the, the ability was there. It's a brand new thing. <laughs> it was a brand new thing. And the person came in and he said, this is, I love this story. He comes in and he says, Sega just announced that there's a uh, that they're coming out with a handheld and Gunpei looked up he's like are they going with monochrome or full color and the guy looks down really embarrassed and kind of he said they're going full color and Gunpei smiled and goes oh good then we're fine (laughs) and and that story is so backwards that story is so backwards because he's like you just got told by your your engineer that someone's coming out with a better product and he sighed with relief and said oh good they went color we're fine because he understood that at the time there were no lithium ion rechargeable batteries that all of these things were going to be charged by an AC plug into the wall or which I don't even think they the first generations did I don't remember that double A's was going to be the name of the game the game gear took 8 and lasted 4 hours the uh the game boy the took four. 4 and lasted between 10 and 16 depending on factors yeah you could play most of the day yeah you could play you really could play for you know, intermittently for a whole weekend on one set of four batteries where you could play for an evening on a Game Gear. And that made the Game Gear, it didn't last long. It, yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog was cooler than Mario. It really was, but... It's a toy, and if it stops yeah, working... Like, <laughs> you know, yes, playing Sonic the Hedgehog was so much more fun than playing Tetris, but I played Tetris for, like... Hours. Bajillions of hours. And I played Sonic for, like, 15 minutes till the guy was like, hey, man, you're killing my battery, give it back. <laughs> well, because I had a Game Boy, I never had a Game Gear. But that idea of innovation, that concept of Gunpei Yokoi, the owners, the the heads, the board of Nintendo were saying, make it color, make it good, make it better, make it this. And his engineer came in and said, oh, man, we're getting beat to market with a better product. And he smiles and, oh, good, we're we're good. <laughs> the idea of that and, and lateral thinking of whether technology or its Japanese counterpart is still on the wall to this day. Of, of Nintendo headquarters. And if you think about, if you just, if you hold the PlayStation and the Xbox next to each other on one hand, mm-hmm. and you look at Nintendo on the other, one is pushing technology. And Nintendo, like I, like I always say, I work for the show, it works for the game. It thinks of what a game would be fun. It plays the game. And so that's why their graphics are very simple. Their games tend to be more involved. They're, t- you know, they're more haptic. They're more kinetic. Yeah. Uh, they aren't as over designed. They aren't. They are not as sensory. 
well, actually, or they're more sensory, depending on your definitions. Uh, Xbox and PlayStation are technology companies, and they have pushed the technology. But Nintendo, since the 1800s, has been a gaming company, and they work for the game. So they use lateral thinking of withered technology to push the game forward, not the tech. And that is such an interesting... And anyone that looks at the gaming industry, you'd have to say that in so many ways, Nintendo is not competing with Sony. They just aren't. I mean, they are in a they sheer number. Take space on your television, but other than that, yeah, they're not. They're competing to do for the time. Same thing. They're competing for time and and attention of gamers, but they're not competing uh, with products. It's and it's such an interesting way of looking at it. Lateral thinking of wither technology. All right. Well, we're going to take another break, and when we come back, I want to talk about ways that lateral thinking with uh, wither technology can be applied to uh, absolutely our listeners. are back. This is Release the Creative for those of you who somehow made your way into a podcast halfway without... Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose it could happen. It's, uh, suppose, you but, know, they're watching, they're, they're, they're little brothers watching on YouTube and they walk in and they're like, hey, what's that? That guy looks cool. That's, uh, that's Release the Creative. You, of course. That's what they're talking about. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we've been, we, we started off talking about video games and, and uh, the rise of video games yeah. and uh, the, the way that Nintendo has... Um, never push the hardware forward because they're trying to serve the game. They're serving the game. Right. And uh, the way they did that was by looking at, well, what's available now? What can we use in a new a new right. way? Right. Um, so what what are other ways of doing that? that like, that's a cool story, but right. <laughs> like, what, how else is this applicable? So I want to start by, so this last year I went to MAGFest. That's the Music and Gaming Festival. It's every year is the first weekend in January, which is to say usually it's like January 3rd or January 2nd. Right away, yeah. Uh, it's the first at the... Uh, Gaylord uh, National Mar Harbor Maryland, right? uh, in Maryland, just here in the D.C. area. And it's such a really, really cool show um, convention. I went there and, and I was talking to the board there and I was having a really great weekend. And they introduced me to something that I'd never seen before, and it's called Demo Scene. Now, those I, words are things I know, but what is yeah, it exactly? exactly. <laughs> I, had, I had never heard of Demo Scene, as, as said that. And what it is, is, is it's people now that are going back and hacking old systems, and I'm talking Atari, Nintendo, mm -hmm. uh, original systems, and they are literally cracking these open from a hacker standpoint, not not literally. I guess it could take some soldering, but they're going back, and the whole idea is that they're wanting to prove uh, what they can do with this same kind of concept. It doesn't spurn from the same place, but the idea is is that they want to show the, their coding ability mm -hmm. with very, very little. And so I'm in there watching these unbelievable unbelievably cool things and they're like yeah that is four kilobytes and i'm like that's not possible <laughs> they're like yeah. there there's no art in that i was like it's like what are you talking about i'm looking at landscapes and he's like right that's not art that oh, is shapes that is code they have written that is a demo of someone's coding all of that is just geomet that is just lines of code that is telling it to draw shapes and I'm looking at some of this stuff, and some of it was getting up into 64-bit, but one of the coolest things that I saw was they were going back to 8-bit old Atari chips, and they were doing things that were insane. Google this stuff, just demo scene. Even um, there are videos that we'll talk for hours on YouTube about how like the original Super Mario Brothers was programmed, right? and they, they can spend hours talking about it. Right. Um, fun, fun fact, if you look at the clouds in the sky and the bushes on the ground yeah they're the same one's yellow or one i'm sorry one's green that's a bush the one's white that's a cloud but if you take the color away it's the exact same it's the exact shape. same shape they've, that's that's really cool repurposed it <laughs> but what people have done is they've gone the other way they've gone back and they've taken the exact same tech and instead of just this arms race of technology they've gone back and done unbelievable things where without using anything new, just overclocking and ripping it apart and just really, really, really pushing the edges. They're finding out that they were capable of way more with what they had then than they ever used, Because they, but they moved on to the next thing really fast. If you look, it's interesting, if you look at 
Super um, original NES original Nintendo games, right? Like the first several, they looked like that pit jumper game you're talking about. Like right. Super Mario Brothers was the most advanced thing on the platform, right. and it looks awful. And I, mean, I love it. It's, like, it's just very basic. If you look at uh, Nintendo, overlapped with Super Nintendo. They kept making games for a couple for, of years. Yeah, um, they made. You remember when Super um, Super Mario World came out on the Super Nintendo, and it oh, was yes. a big, huge upgrade, and it was incredible. They made a Mario game for original Nintendo that looked like. Super Mario World. Right. Uh, and, and there's a lot of compromises there. Sure. It was not the same thing at all, but it looked very close. Right. And if you had gone back to 1984 and said, hey, look, you could do this, like people would have laughed at you. No, I mean, and it's it's because because there's it's two different things happening at the same time. Like I said, at the very top of the show, one person does a thing. And so they build new tech and then that person exploits the tech. And but unbelievable capabilities are being left in the dust. And and to kind of, you know, uh, Alita Battle Angel, there's a lot of really cool tech in the garbage piles that because because yeah. we've moved on. And if you start Googling like demo scene, go on YouTube and look at demo scene, you'll see these things that they've been ported to video files now, but they're originally these unbelievable landscapes and music and all this really cool stuff. And you're like, yeah, four kilobytes. And you're like, screw you, man. <laughs> it's a MIDI. It's a MIDI file with a digital. It's so cool. My point there being sometimes we we always I, I don't know an entrepreneur that doesn't get caught up in this. Eh, it's not true, but it's it is so tempting to get caught up in this race of getting there first, first on the scene. We have to release our tech first. We have to, and and there are some obviously, and there are some obvious reasons for that. But it's unnecessary in general. In general, you really can step back and say, okay, that is one way to do it, and everyone is is racing to that way. What did we leave in the trash that could do maybe not this, but something else? What what can we do with what we have? Yeah, we uh, was it the first or second episode where we talked about the studio we're sitting in. Um, hopefully to those of us watching on YouTube, this looks incredible yeah. on screen. But uh, a lot of this is repurposed from our video production company. Th things that we were like, eh, this is old. We don't want to use this anymore. Yeah. Let, let's get rid of this. Well, let's get rid of it. Actually turn into let's put it into the studio. Wait. And guess what? It still still works great. Like the cameras specifically, the cameras, not this switcher, but the original switcher we had. The, the cameras and the switcher specifically, when we when uh, when Corey and I first started doing our Twitch channel uh, about two years ago, it, it literally was we wanted to start doing this show, but we're a video production company. We couldn't just take up resources. And I literally went to our scrap pile and I was like, we don't use this anymore, do we? We're like, uh, like once a year. I'm like, cool. And so we <laughs> built the studio out of the ashes of, of discarded things. And our cameras, which we spent, I don't know, four grand each on, uh, we needed a third and we bought it for 500 bucks on eBay. That's what they cost now. They're, yeah. Like they're, they're, and we've had so many comments when I was doing conventions and, and building the studio, this mo mobile studio. I had people from ABC and NBC coming up and saying, like, how are you doing this? Because we were doing an entire three camera live to air thing from a convention floor, from a convention floor on batteries, no power because and everyone else was paying ten thousand dollars for the convention to give them power. And we were running everything to include the Internet line off batteries and moving very fast. And they're like, how are you doing this? Where did you get this tech? And I'm like, from a garbage? Like it's <laughs> it's old stuff. And so I had other streamers stopping and saying, where can I buy this stuff? And I'm like, eBay, your local pawn shop. <laughs> and it was that everyone was so dying to find the next world solution. They, look, they, they were not paying attention to what yesterday had. Again, it's like the demo scene thing. Go back and see what 8-bit can do. It's way more than you think. And I'm not saying go buy an 8-bit computer. I'm saying that <laughs> people are so wrapped up in buying tomorrow's solution, they forget that yesterday's was still perfectly good and had some gas in the tank, had some miles left. Uh, and by using lateral thinking of weather technology, you know, when we were building this, we were talking to one of the engineers who said, gave us a price. And I said, uh, I don't, uh, I want to pay way less. And was, well, that's what it's going to take. That's how much this costs. I was like, no, that's what it costs to do it that way. Let's do that, it a different way. That's what it costs to do it with the newest and the greatest. We don't need the newest nor the greatest. We need this ability. I work for the show. I don't work for the technology. I don't work for the camera companies. I work for the show. The show needs a picture. I just need a camera. Yeah, other than the putting it on the internet, what we're doing in this room was established in the 1950s. Like that's the there is not a piece of gear 
that we are using right now like, leds i guess they, well the tvs are thinner like the the way the right. technology was built has changed but right. the pieces and like if you were to go back to rockefeller center 1952 oh yeah nbc like well you would have a microphone yes it would go into a soundboard yes uh with an analog video uh, analog audio cable you yeah know, so that hasn't even changed um and you would have a you know a yeah three cameras and a video switcher and right. they would put it on a um, it would go live over a tower instead of putting it on YouTube. So right. where it ends up is different, but the 90 yeah. percent of it's the same. And I mean, and even a lot of the gear we're using is a decade old. Us personally. I mean, some of it is yeah. a little newer that MacBook, for example. Yeah. But but now there's some 20 year old stuff in this. <laughs> there's absolutely some 20 year old stuff. And the thing is, is that I people sometimes I, I've had some techno uh technologues and, and these like kind of sneer they're like oh well we have the new black magic studio system or oh we're using the red camera to which I sneer um, or we're using all these like I'm using the a7 I have an a7 like we're using all these great stuff and I am so much more proud that we're doing it with garbage like to me that's that's a statement of pride not a statement of yeah well I couldn't afford the nice stuff I don't I could afford the nice stuff I used it elsewhere the one the one caveat here that's it's tempting to get into this as a worldview for like, oh, that's great for everything. We absolutely do understand that there are certain projects. We have a Sony FS7. If I'm making something for broadcast, oh, absolutely. I get out the film lenses and the nice video camera and we have other gear for other purposes. But yeah, early on, we got caught in a trap where uh, you, you saw this very early on, but myself and my other uh, business partner at the time, we were like, we want we want to we have the best camera. We want to use the best camera all the time. And it's aware on your resources. It gets overscheduled. It gets extra yeah. use that breaks down sooner. It's like, no, you use the really nice equipment for the really nice projects where it is necessary. This right. is going on TV. This is going in the movie theater. You know, sure. we've done projects that we're going to have a theatrical. Um, we've shot things for CNN and, you know, and yeah. in those cases, yeah, bring out the good gear. But when you're going to Twitch, using that gear to go would to be Twitch, stupid. It was it's clock hours, it's chip hours, it's, it's yeah. And so we kind of had to start realizing that, like, no, some projects need this, other projects need that. Throwing your your A game equipment at every single project was not a good strategy. Well, no, and I mean, even to that that same concept and that same that same partner is we were talking about how we needed, you know, this this new stabilizing was this new thing and everyone had stabilizers. Everyone had the For the, those of you just tuning in by stabilizer, he means a gimbal or gyroscope system on which you can place a camera and walk around with it. Continue. That, that's that's true. <laughs> um, thank you for the clarification. Um, and everyone's like, oh, I need the Ronin adapter. I need the this. I need that, you know, and the Ronin was kind of like the name of the game. And the Ronin has different tiers. And we were looking into it. And and, you know, so I said to to our kind of engineer head guys, like, so how much would it cost us to get into a Ronin? He's like, you know, I've done the price breakdown you know, about 12 grand. And I'm like, God, oh, geez, we just can't do that right now. And for about a year, I came back and said, should we readdress the Ronin? He's like, we just don't. 12 grand is more than we have for this project right now. And so finally, after it literally was like 11 months, I went back and looked and I was like, well, that one's 11 grand. But that one's for this camera that we wouldn't want. And I went through and I found that we could get a Ronin for two grand. And we did. So to you know, throw myself under the bus here, I agreed with him at <laughs> yeah. the time because we had the big, nice camera. And we said, well, to use the big, nice camera, like to buy the stabilizer for the not best camera didn't make any sense to me. And I was like, that's what we need. And finally, you managed to <laughs> get it through my head that like, well, but the projects we need it for aren't those right. projects. The, like CNN is never asking us. The, the, the high end people, they wanted tripod shoots anyway. Right. Like the, what, what needed the gimbal was, was our A7 <laughs> was the conventions and the Twitch streaming and the you which know, was the lighter the camera, live the stuff. Li so we we were, you know, I not wanting to micromanage, you know, stayed back I was like cool 12 grand that's the answer but when we actually dug into it it was two it was it was way cheaper and and everyone gets into this thing of if if everything's a rat race you don't start looking at the pieces and if you work for the show if you work for your assets then you're always wanting the best but if you work for the show if you work for the project you don't work for your boss you don't work for your client if you work for the show and you serve the show well now that opens up an entirely different mind frame I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm finally coming around to that point of view too. So yeah, we can, you can always keep learning. <laughs> it's, it is, it's truly, it is truly a, uh, I, you know, I started doing it mostly to be confrontational, uh, because that's just who I am. And I, I didn't like clients. I, I didn't like being told what things needed when I didn't agree. And, and I came up with just, if you work for the show, everybody wins. And if you work for yourself or your client or your boss 
someone has to lose. But if the product is the goal, if you're worried about making the best game, not the best game console, if you're worried about the best game, that's a very different goal. If you're worried, if you're about if you're about finishing on time and under budget, okay, that's important. But if you're worried about the, having the most successful project, that is a different thing than being on time and under budget. Yeah, I've always thought of myself as a media producer, but I've uh, in my mind when I say that, I think cameras. Right. And I need to be thinking viewer. You need to be thinking exactly what, what the end user, what they're experiencing, how they're experiencing it, what they like. It right. needs to serve that. Right. Not you know. So you and I both went, my own ego. <laughs> we, we we both went to I went to a, a film school and you went to a video production and we we both get caught up. You know, they're like this new camera has this many pixels and does this many things and does. We also both came up in megapixel culture where this new camera has five point six. This new camera has six point one. This new camera has fifty four point twelve. Yeah. And you're like. You realize that after 4.6, it almost doesn't matter, right? <laughs> like, uh, there's some caveats to that. But the camera takes a better picture, but it doesn't tell a better story. The audience only cares about the story. And yes, better cameras allow for better stories. But if you if you just chase the cameras, your stories don't get better. If you chase the story and let the camera serve the story, then everybody wins. And fun fact for those of you aspiring filmmakers getting out there right now, you can rent anything <laughs> for cheap. It used to be a mindset that like, well, to be a media production company, we have to have the ability to shoot a feature film. No, and you, we can for you, the record you really don't need it in house because if someone's making a feature film, I've got enough time to get on the phone and rent right. whatever I need. We have done some remarkably large shoots with a bunch of gear that I don't currently own because right. I don't need to own it. But when we first got into this, we did. We went out and spent a lot of money to make sure that we could shoot anything on the drop of a hat. And it, it's a fallacy of thinking. It's work for the story. Drop of the hat stuff is fast. And if it's going to be big, you've got time to work it out. Yeah. So lateral is, thinking of withered technology. That is our show today. Lateral thinking of withered technology. Right. I'm going to try to think of other ways to apply it to my life. I've uh, worked for the show, work been, for the project, been putting it into uh, into our business. But uh, I'm going I'm to think about that this week. Awesome. So that's uh, that's it for this week. We'll be back later. This is Release the Creative. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah? Well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult?